um, great to hear about the New Zealand experience. Uh, we might go to Tony Abbott in questions, do you think? Uh, might be the safest place to do it. Um, now, it's widely asserted that Australia's political culture is broken and that we've lost the uh, capacity for reform, for long-term thinking, and uh, we're unwilling and unable to embrace necessary reform. And Oliver, of course, has, um, Oliver, of course, has, uh, I thought there was some magic one up here at the Grand Hyatt, but no, it's just coming across. Um, so uh, he's, you know, pointed out that, uh, that Paul Kelly and others, in court, Paul is becoming the, the great curmudgeon of Australian um, uh, political reform. Uh, and they contrast uh, current experience with a generally more successful past. And Australians look to New Zealand, I think, increasingly um, for their more successful rec record around innovation and reform, and we wonder why. We wonder how and why it came to this. We've long since uh, gotten used to it on the rugby field, but that it's extended to governance too, I think, uh, is making us all uh, a bit uneasy. So I just want to explain that in my comments today, um, they're informed by two ANZOG-funded research projects. Uh, one on Prime Minister's Chiefs of Staff and a second one um, that Rod Rhodes and I are doing on examining the dynamics of central executives in four Westminster style countries, Australia, Canada, New Zealand and the UK. We've got cases from Queensland and Victoria as samples as well to provide a, a sub-national and a federal comparison. Uh, the two Chiefs of Staff books were published in 2014 and uh, Rod and I are going to publish this next one, Minister's Courts, uh, with Palgrave next year. So I guess these projects provide a really uh, unique contemporary insight into the working uh, dynamics of, of decision and advisory systems and the, those networks at the very centre of central government. And they highlight some themes that um, are really relevant, I think, to the conference themes of transparency and engagement. Um, and some of them I'll talk about now, but just to sort of foreground them, uh, the primacy of coping and survival in the calculus of political administrative elites cannot be overstated and is evident in all four countries. Um, fragmentation and, co and the quest for coherence as uh, really dominating a lot of time, but it's a, it's a quest without end and without success. Uh, the push to centralisation and small group decision making everywhere uh, in our political systems, and that's having um, a bunch of problems. Now, the commentary on uh, differences between Australia and New Zealand often focuses on, well, it's easier to do reform in New Zealand uh, because they don't have a federal system. And I was very heartened that Oliver didn't mention that. Um, uh, you know, sometimes we talk about the unitary parliament, mixed member proportional uh, electoral system that makes it difficult and, you know, constrains leaders in lots of ways. I am persuaded that MMP has a, an impact on political culture. I'm less persuaded by the federalism argument. Um, a lack of checks and balances has at time led, led New Zealand to implement some horrible policies, particularly in housing regulation and others. Um, but I do think that Prime Minister Keyes, uh, you know, I think Prime Minister Key is a really interesting case. Uh, and I think, too, that, uh, you know, it's trade exposure um, and it's, uh, you know, uh, much more... Uh uh, existential uh, experience of different uh, economic uh, times has really focused uh, people's minds on reform in a way that the mining boom maybe insulated Australians from doing. But I think there's something generational about key and about English that I think is very interesting to me, and I'd put Mike Baird in this kind of category too. There's something interesting about a generational shift that we might come back to. And I think there's something, you know, maybe in New Zealand it's an issue of scale, but I think there's something about career politics uh, that we need to come back to maybe in questions um, and discussion. So I want to suggest that, uh, you know, the political culture being broken or the difficulties of reform is actually at least partly structural and it's embedded in and an unintended consequence of successive waves of reform and change within the Australian core executive over the past 40 years. And ministers, I argue, and particularly prime ministers, have driven many of those changes, but taken together those actions and decisions have undermined both the quality of advice and support that's available to them and the routines and processes that provided advice and options, opportunities to consider it, debate and contest it. So uh, I think that that's a significant part and I'll go on to develop that argument now. Now, lest anyone think I'm verbaling any particular leader, um, I'd note that uh, questions about the performance of Prime Ministers and Premier's offices have featured in the reviews uh, into the defeats of the Napthine and Newman governments, one-term governments and the challenge to Tony Abbott's leadership in February 2015, uh, and under Rudd and Gillard as well, and we explore this at length in our books. And Sherry made a really interesting point yesterday, or many, but the one that really appealed to me was this divergence governan divergent governance standard that we have that applies to the political class, which is contrasted to expectations in other, sector other sectors. 
And it's not accidental, I don't think, that we're seeing a profound loss of trust in the capacity and integrity of our political processes and institutions. Now, that's evident in the social media debate on Choppergate. We could spend a lot of time on that. Uh, but it's evident, too, in opinion polling um, and, I think, you know, quite starkly in the defeat of two first-term governments in Victoria and Queensland. And yet they don't learn. Uh, and this is something I want to come back to because I think this is a, a real challenge for us, but I think there's a structural reason why they don't. Um, I think it's significant that the two Australian national newspapers are hosting a reform summit that specifically ex excludes politicians. Uh, and I think that's something that is very interesting. Um, it's engaging across sectors in a way that is just saying, we can't engage with you, government. There's no point having you at the table. Now, perversely, leaders respond to that kind of pressure and complexity by turning inwards. They retreat to what we talk about as kind of ever-diminishing circles uh, of close advisors and supporters. And I was just really struck by some of Anne's examples yesterday in terms of, you know, government and National Reform Summit might be one example of really risking irrelevance and not even being part of a debate if you don't start to adjust to some of these um, uh, challenges um, and just the kinds of uh, loss of control that political strategists endlessly try to uh, prepare for but obviously never can. Now of course it's really really hard to get on the front foot, nobody knows that better than me, I've spent a lot of time around ministers and prime ministers, um, but being informed and prepared about the dynamics of leadership, the constraints and contingencies as well as the opportunities can I think really help and you don't get that by systematically undermining the institutional memory and your capacity to learn from experience in your system. Them. And I think to go to some of the points that I make here, we can see the, the limits of centralisation and the lack of openness and transparency that's often associated with it. They're constantly exposed through the lack of co coordination and coherence across the ministry and government. You know, captain's picks. A new term that's entered the political lexicon. Um, poor communication and sequencing of decisions. Really bad cabinet process that has uh, major, thing, major issues introduced under the line uh, and then you know, springs a whole lot of leaks from the cabinet. Um, policy reversals in the face of apparently unexpected resistance. Well, that's just bad staff work. So how do we end up in these situations? Um, I think uh, there are fundamental questions, you know, and transparency is important, but for me, we're really reaching a point where capacity and effectiveness uh, are the key questions. Um, and both, but leaders seem unable or, or unwilling to recognise, or they're so locked in their own path dependency that they can't see an underlying structural cause that in fact, is something to do with them. So, my presentation focuses on those impediments to reform and change that I think are inherent to this hybrid advisory system that we've developed. New Zealand is nowhere near as far down the path of this as Australia. Australia is probably at one kind of extreme. Queensland's a little bit past that. Victoria's on the other side of that. Uh, and then, you know, we've got New Zealand and the UK at the other end. Canada much more so towards the hybrid model that we've got in Australia, which has been a surprise to me in the field work. Um, so what are those impediments? Well, I think there are three, and I've, I've hinted at them already. The loss of institutional memory, this associated failure to learn from experience, and leaders' lack of organisational capacity. And I want to outline some potential reform directions if I've got time, um, uh, noting that they, they featured in the difficulties that I've just talked about uh, by current and former um, PMs and premiers, some very former premiers. Um, I argue there are lessons to be learned from New Zealand, but I think too much of the debate in this country is focused on the performance of the public sector, uh, public service, and not enough on the demand side of the equation. Um, overcoming some of the problems that I'm talking about would require the political class to reform and change its modus, oper its modus operandi, um, and to be prepared to uh, really embrace arrangements and frameworks that support rather than undermine their capacity to set and maintain a focus on priorities, um, their ability to control the political and policy agenda within the constraints of what you can do in a, uh, a very unpredictable environment, and their ability to negotiate and manage the many relationships and contingencies and dependencies that characterise life at the centre of government. They really don't seem to have understood how much the context has changed. Now, just very quickly, people would know that everywhere leaders are reshaping their advisory systems to cope with common pressures. And we've seen growth, institutionalisation, politicisation, that's a contested term, but what I, you know, in the literature, we're sort of using it as the, the advent of partisan advisors. Um, and hybridisation, this real blurring of the boundaries between partisan and nonpartisan sources. There's been significant growth and centralisation around leaders, as anybody who works in Commonwealth or state um, government will be able to tell you. Um, 
communication and issues management become uh, becoming really important and bureaucratic routines of control and coordination really struggling to cope with system demands and this coping and surviving a constant preoccupation so people who tell us they know what their day is going to be like by what's on the front page of the, the Herald Sun or the Korea Mail God forbid um, recent Australian Prime Ministers have really struggled to make a successful transition um, this now goes back to John Howard this has now been the case since 1996 that leaders have struggled to make transitions. Howard, Rudd, Gillard and Abbott all faced trouble. Um, I, you know, Rudd was arguably more successful in his transition in the first 12 months, mostly because of the support of the leadership team and I think John Faulkner played a really important role in that as Special Minister of State. It's often forgotten that John Howard himself faced leadership speculation in 1997 after the travel rorts affair. Remember that? There was something to be learned from that, I think. Um, you know, <laughs> 1997. Uh, and he was, but he was never challenged for the job. And the reason Howard wasn't challenged for the job is because he made changes. Um, and he learned the lessons uh, to deal with the difficulties and criticisms that he faced. The other three have faced leadership challenges early in their term. Unprecedented in terms of that kind of leadership instability. Now, the problems that leaders have in you know, making the transition uh, are often attributed to the pace and complexity of decision making. This has all been well described. Um, but the recurrence, the persistent recurrence of this under four successive prime ministers, I think, and, and a number of premiers, I think means that we need to ask ourselves the question. Now, our work with chiefs of staff and this current project that we're working on has revealed significant concerns about institutional memory within the central executive. The problem's well understood uh, in the presidential context, but at the level of uh, political leadership in Australia seems less well understood. Um, it's especially acute, the problem of institutional memory in Australia at both Commonwealth and state levels. And I've just li listed some of the drivers of its, uh, of its loss. Um, but the point, the major thing to consider is that institutional memory is essential to the ability to learn, to avoid the mistakes of your predecessors. And I think travel rorts is just an amazing case in point uh, in terms of how little has been learned. So I argue really that this is a problem of leader's own making, the lack, the lack of institutional memory. Uh, it's a relatively recent development and they're responsible for it. And it flows from, not necessarily consciously, but they are respons responsible for it. The decision to shift their main source of advice and support from PM&C or, or DPCs at the state level into the Prime Minister's or Premier's office has had profound consequences. And the PMO is now performing key coordinating tasks that was once the province of the public service. And so the, the role of the Chief of Staff has become re really critical. So it matters who is in the Chief of Staff role. And the most recent um, appointees have had very little in terms of uh, bureaucratic experience and very few networks on which to draw uh, when they come into the job. The way into the job differs from the way they've come into the job in the past and we demonstrate that in the book. There's another kind of, I think, quite important thing about uh, the, the PMO which we need to consider is that when those people go, the whole show goes. Uh, and so each Prime Minister's office is starting all over again. Now, I had a lot of trouble persuading Rod this was the case. He found this absolutely unbelievable uh, that, you know, over time we could demonstrate empirically that that was the case. I think there's another point that will be um, familiar to people here, which is the hyper-partisanship of Australian politics and this reflex to denigrate and smash the legacy of the people who you've just defeated. So you spend the first two years doing that before you actually get on with your agenda. Uh, and I think that limits um, and inhibits the ability and willingness to learn. So let me be quick. We've got a hybrid advisory model that has evolved since the 1970s in Australia. Um, and that's delivered ministers greater responsiveness and political control, no doubt about that. But it hasn't resolved the fundamental question of, of competence and responsiveness. And this is what still hasn't been, this hasn't been sorted through. Um, depend, they remain dependent on many things, but including the public service. So the need to uh, preserve institutional memory is really important. New Zealand does a much better job of preserving institutional memory just systemically, so we might talk about that in Q&A. The hybrid model has made it then the responsibility of prime ministers to organise, a, to organise and manage the advisory system instead of leaving that to people who are good at that kind of stuff and who know about it. So it's put a burden on them that they didn't face before. I don't think they have particular insight uh, into that. One of the striking things in our research everywhere with the possible exception of New Zealand, has been an increasingly distant relationship with the public service. The central courts at the central, very centre of the central executive no longer regard the public service as central or even necessary to decision making. 
And as many of you will know from experience, just keeping in the loop is really hard. And grappling to adapt to the dilemmas that this changing context um, uh, pr you know, uh, provides in terms of your ability to influence it. And yet we still talk about public sector reform. It's kind of interesting. Anyway, um, there's of course the whole question of contestability, more fluid advisory systems. And it seems to me that institutional memory, while it's really good to have alternative sources of advice and ministers think that's really important, there's a fundamental problem of institutional memory with ad hoc arrangements. Um, Everett Lindquist has done some work on this in, in the past. So where does authority lie? Now, I'll spend just a little minute on, because um, the odious bell is going to ring, I think. <laughs> this idea of organisational capacity is a term that I've just been using, but essentially it's a concept drawn from the presidential studies literature. And I guess in the American context where you have a whole bunch of people moving out and a whole bunch of new people moving in to take over, they really have to think about how they're going to operate the machine. We haven't had until recently to start to need to think about these kinds of things. But in the Australian context, it might include things like this, forging an effective team recruiting an appropriately qualified chief of staff, making sure good people serve in, in the PMO or the Premier's office and across, to coordinate, to work with others, to develop effective relationships across the ministry, say, or the party room, just for example, um, to ensure quality advice is coming in, to discipline the flow of advice and create effective arrangements, uh, to communicate the narrative, work to do there, I think, um, and to try and uh, coordinate what we all know is a very difficult, uh, impossible arrange set of arrangements to coordinate. But still, there's a bunch of disciplines that you can bring to bear. And I think career politics just doesn't necessarily prepare Prime Ministers to do that. I don't think it's a very good use of their time or expertise, frankly, and so we need to have a different conversation with them. So what might be done? There's just no going back to the model as it was before, despite the lamentations of, you know, Terry Moran or, or Gary, I think, has made some similar remarks, or Jennifer Westacott. There's no going back to the way it was before, and politicians won't allow it. But also, importantly, the staffers do things that public servants shouldn't and can't. So I think that's, we should take in as read. But I think, so I'm interested in the reform agenda uh, as being much more to do with what could be done to preserve institutional memory. And I've got some uh, specific suggestions there. What we know is that there's been persistent resistance from Australian politicians, not just to reforming travel entitlements, but also um, on both sides they've resisted attempts to themselves become the focus for reform and change. Arthur Tang talked about this in the 1980s. Uh, so it's really interesting. They need to be persuaded that they're poorly served by their current arrangements. And for me, that's the next frontier. And I suppose I'm struck by... Uh, you know, the New Zealand experience, because they have got responsiveness, but it's still heavily predicated on the role of the public service. It doesn't mean that it's going outside, or it doesn't mean they're not going outside for alternative points of view, um, but they're doing it in a way that still maintains a, a degree of institutional memory. So I was feeling a bit depressed about how things are going in Australia. And, and Robin said to me, is there anything that can be done to feel depressed? Well, the only thing was this, um, that, you know, look, it's going really well for New Zealand, but min their minister's critiques of public service advice is that it's not citizen informed enough. So it's not as though there aren't critiques over there. Um, but whatever their frustrations, New Zealand ministers do seem to accept that the, that the public service is important in terms of uh, continuity institutional memory, and they haven't gone as far as Australian uh, countries. What I think we need to really think about is um, transparency about how those uh, mechanics work at the centre of government. We know very little about it. The work that's been done in this area is the work that we've done in this area. Uh, and that's kind of it uh, in terms of you know, how this machine works. So there's really no institutional memory to operate the very central parts of government. And that's a frailty that worries me. Uh, I think we really need to be debating this much more seriously and I think that means that ministers uh, need to become, or stop being the elephant in the room of public sector reform and become part of it. Thank you. <laughs>